Yeah. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, Egypt out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Thou, thou shalt not make unto thee any human images, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto the and of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not, not do any work. Thou, nor thy, thy son, nor thy daughter, thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy, thy father and thy mother, that thy, thy days may be long upon the land which, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. He just said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. But now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophet according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Between 2017 and 2019, John and Jen were excited to spend 10 months in the South Pacific as associates in mission. Workers in the country of Vanuatu. They served under Peter and Robin Brasher, the veteran missionaries previously ministered in the Solomon Islands in Papua New Guinea. John and Jen were excited for the opportunity to serve the mission work and to learn from the missionaries' wise and experienced leadership. On Friday evening in Vanuatu, the missionaries invited the younger couple to their house for homemade pizza and fellowship. 
migration, migration, migration began to regal them on the stories of their mission, mission ministry around the South Pacific. They told stories of protection from sickness and disease. They spoke about working with cannibals and children of cannibals in Papua New Guinea. They recalled the many sacrifices of Western comfort. They voluntarily gave up in order to reach the wonderful inhabitants of the South Pacific with the gospel. John and Jen said to one, amazed at the privilege to hear such great stories of faith firsthand while eating some of the best homemade pizza on the planet. They were full of questions for these veterans of the faith. And at one point, John asked if they had ever feared their, for their safety or if they would have rather stayed and pastored in a westernized country closer to family with modern medicines and conveniences. Missionary Peter Grayson did not have to think for long. He responded, one thing I have discovered is you're always safer in the will of God than anywhere else. That's right. And you follow God's will and his commandments. There is nowhere else that could possibly be safe. Right. Yes, we could have passed through the westernized country in a safe suburb, but that wouldn't have been God's will. We would have been in one in more spiritual and physical danger there because we were outside of God's plan for our lives. So when you are in God's will and following his commandments, it doesn't matter if you're in the most remote island or even a war-torn, oppressive country, you will always be safer in God's will than anywhere else in the world. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord, saints. I want to thank Minister Allen for that introduction to the Sunday School lesson. I also like to give an honor to God, who was head of my life, Pastor Mo I mean, Bishop Morrison, for allowing me this opportunity to teach the Sunday School lesson. Amen. And uh, how many of y'all know that there is no safer place in the whole entire universe than in the will of God? Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> This uh, set, we, we're, we're still coming from our uh, word, of, uh, word of God for life, Sunday School material, and we're still in, uh, we're in the, uh, the third series of the first lesson in dealing with the children of Israel and the law. And uh, we know like last week, Mr. Allen taught about the exodus of the children of Israel out of the captivity of Egypt. You know what I'm saying? Now, when it's one thing to, to be released from prison or to be, to come out of Egypt, but the hardest, that was, that was pretty much the easy thing. But the very difficult thing was to get Egypt out of them. You know what I'm saying? Because they had been to Egypt for over four, what's that, 430 years. And that's a lot of generations to be in the same place. And they have been under slavery for over 120 years, I think. Is that correct? Huh? At least, yeah. At least 120 years. So that's a lot of that's a lot, that's a long time to be the same way. And y'all know how it is that the, you know people don't like to change. And change is hard. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, when, when this Sunday school lesson, we see the children of Israel coming to the Mount of Sinai. And the Mount Sinai is where the Lord began to deal with Moses. Moses told Moses to come up to the mountain, and the Lord began to give Moses the commandments. Amen. Now, we know, we all know the story of the Ten Commandments, but it wasn't just, you know, a lot of people think about the Ten Commandments, they just think those ten. But after the Ten Commandments, Moses brought down the ten, he began to also instruct them on the final points of the law. Now, there was not more than just Ten Commandments. Altogether, there were 613 distinct commandments. Not only, not only were there 600, 
and 13 distinct commandments, there was, uh, after a period of time had passed, they also had what they call fences of the law. What they would do is, after Moses gave the, the commandments in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, what they would, what they, what the sages and what the, uh, and what the uh, scribes and stuff would do is they begin to add to the law what they call making fences to the law. And a fence to the law was something that they would put up to keep you from breaking the law. So say, for instance, if uh, uh, the law said you should not steal, well, a fence to the law was they would say, if you ain't going to die, don't pick it up. Now, it ain't bad. So about the time Christ had came, on the, uh, 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 Christ was manifesting on earth, the law had became this huge, big debate and ominous thing that they was trying to uphold. You understand? And uh, that is why when Christ came, he came to fulfill the law or to show the more perfect or show the actual spirit or intent of the law. A lot of times folk was, folk was missing the intent of the law, you know what I'm saying, just to make themselves feel like they was better than somebody else. Now, part of the weakness of the law, what they begin to do is they say, you know what that law says, there should be no work on the Sabbath day. Right? Well, this is one day, a house, because houses weren't built with all the codes and stuff that we have, the houses were prone to collapse on people. So one day, a house collapsed on somebody, and they collapsed on that person on the Sabbath day. And they began to have this debate, what should we do? Well, the, they came up with this fence of the law of state that said, well, if the person is a Jew, we'll dig him out that day. But if he was not a Jew, we'll wait till the next day to dig him out. So basically, the law to them had become a form of them becoming more self-righteous. And what Christ came to do was Christ came to uh, <clears throat> bring back the actual intent. That's why when they said, when he said fulfill the law, what he was bringing was the actual intent of the law. And the intent of the law is, what is the law fulfilled with? It is love. Because love worketh no ill towards its name. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, <clears throat> to understand, now just, just, just before we get into our Sunday school lesson, I want to go into this because it's very important to understand the, 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 the whole intent and what the law was because there is debate even to now these days. Yeah. You got some folks that say, you know, uh, why ain't y'all going to church on Saturday instead of Sunday? Or, and the Bible tells us don't get into those discussions. Don't get into those discussions. You know what I'm saying? But there is discussion amongst a lot of people nowadays that want to still bring up the old Mosaic law. And for us to understand the concept of what we're dealing with, I, I thought about it would be good to go into a little bit of what you call dispensations. You heard Pastor, you heard the Bishop talk about that the greatest dispensation is the greatest dispensation. We're living, we are living in the greatest dispensation. Yes, yes. And a dispensation is a time period, a particular time period how God dealt with man in a particular way. That's basically the my best way of explaining a dispensation. Now, let me give you an example. Um, I make sure I don't thought about have, have a thought process right here. <laughs> okay, now let's take upon the example of Noah. We all know who Noah was. What was Noah saved by? Faith. Who? Who said grace? I heard, that's, that's right, sister. Noah 
was saved by grace. See, now, dispensation has to deal with how God meted out grace at a particular time towards a particular person. And what that grace took the form of. Okay, so God said, God said it says, Noah found grace in the sight of God. Noah was saved by grace. And Noah was a just man and perfect man in his generation. Now, Noah heard the word of God, he believed the word of God, and he obeyed the word of God. That is called faith. So, without grace and faith, Noah could not be saved. So, and how, and how grace took the form in Noah's time, the Lord told Noah to do something. And what did Noah do? He did what he believed what God said, and he built the ark. Can I get amen? amen? And the Lord told him to pitch the ark with uh, mud on the inside and the outside. Okay, I'm going somewhere. Now, after he built the ark, did the ark save Noah and his family? Yes, it did. It did. Right? It saved them from the appended judgment of God. Okay? Now, let's go forward to nowadays. If you build an ark, would you be saved right now? No! An ark would not do anything for you no more than a regular boat would. Because the ark was to Noah at his particular time and his particular, for a particular purpose. So the ark could not no more save you today than a boat would do right now. Right? So therefore, the commandments could no longer, okay, let's go back. When Moses came down with the mark with the Ten Commandments, and he knew all the Ten Commandments, he was alive at this time. Let's say he was alive at this time. And he said, no, I ain't going to listen to those commandments. I'm going to go and build me an ark again. Would that ark have helped him at that time? No. Because the law was given. Can I get an amen? Now, we are living under grace. Obeying the, the Mosaic law would no more help you under this dispensation than the ark would have helped Noah under the, under the, law, under the laws of prophets. You understand what I'm talking about? Today, we are living under grace. And grace is manifesting itself this way by giving us instructions. Can I get amen? amen? And those instructions on how to be saved is what? Repent, be baptized, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, somebody come and ask Noah when he was building the ark, Noah, why are you putting mud on the inside and outside of that ark? He was saying, because God told him to. Now, if somebody come and ask you, why you get baptized in Jesus' name, you say, because God told us to. And how obedient in each dispensation is how one obtains salvation. You must follow the instructions or the commandment at that time. Can I get amen? Amen. You get okay? Now, now we understand that the law was to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Can I get amen? amen? Now, does that make the, when well, people say, well, that makes the law not a void. No. Because the law, only thing the law did was point out sin. You know what I'm saying? That's all the law did was put a finger on sin. Now, everybody knew and, and this, this is what I tell people. Everybody right now know right from wrong. Don't nobody have to tell you a dog. Go, go. Anybody, like, anybody got dogs? Okay, how many dogs you got, sister? Yeah. You have one? If you have another dog, if you pour food in this dog's dish and then you pour it in another dog's dish, would that other dog know you did wrong? Yes. Yes, even a dog know when it's 
be in this tree. So everybody knows right from wrong. They are called universal laws. Don't you know what I'm saying? So people in there thinking, well, God, we don't know what's right or wrong. For what the law did, the law specifically pointed out every particular right and wrong. Can I get an amen? And what the law did was brought everybody under the condemnation. Because can't hey, know that it's 613 of them. And if you mess up on one of them, you messed up on all. So who in here can actually do it all right all the time? And guess what? The sacrifices that they made at the temple, that didn't take away your sin. Only thing they did was put it off for another year. That's why they have to go in there year after year after year, killing animals after animals after animals, just to put off their fraction, uh, their, their breaking of the law every year. So the law was never designed, was never a purpose, was to take away sin. Have you amen? Amen. But what the law's purpose was, was to bring us to Christ, to bring us to the point that we know without a shadow of a doubt, number one, we can't save ourselves. And number two, we need a Savior. And not only do we need a Savior, we need a heart transplant. Now, we all get into these Debates about the uh, extent of government in our lives. That's what our politics of the day is about. Is what is the role of government in our lives? You know what I'm saying? How far should government extend into our lives? And what is the limit of government in our lives? But here is the truth. No matter how many laws you pass, People still gonna be corrupt. Oh yes. Oh yes. Can I get amen? Amen. amen. You can you can you can tell people that, 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 that folks still gonna be corrupt. Can I get amen? amen? So therefore, there is the very limit of what you call law and government. And whatever we do will be corrupt too. Oh, guess why you can honestly say that. All governments are corrupt because they're ran by, guess what? Falling corrupt men. So what the, what the law was showing in the law of Moses was how, of how low or how desperate the state of man was. And that's why the law brings us to grace and truth. How many of y'all glad for grace and truth? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, the, era, the, the, the time of grace is when God has democratized grace. What he has done is he has extended grace or the availability of grace to everybody. Not just Noah, not just the children of Israel, but everybody in the dispensation of, of, this, of grace have the opportunity to be saved. Amen. Have you amen? Amen. Can I get amen? Amen. So now, let, let's get to some of the Sunday school lesson. It says the most significant uh, difference, uh, it says the Ten Commandments, the first are, 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 are divided into two categories. Yeah. The first four commandments deal with our relationship to God. That's why the first four says, have no other God before me. Don't make a great image. You know what I'm saying? You know, don't, don't, uh, remember the Sabbath day. Those first four deal with our relationship to God. The next six deal with our relationship towards one another. Yeah. Now, there are six, there are four commandments that deal with our relationship with God. 
Six commandments to deal with our relationship with each other. You know what that should let you, let you know, uh, let you come to an understanding? That it's easy to love God and hard to love each other. It takes a little bit more effort to, for, for you to for y'all love me. You want to know why? Because Brother Rose don't always get it right. And even though I don't get it right, what you still got to do? You still got to love me. And it's kind of odd, the first relationship, the first commandment in the relationship commandment is, guess what? Honor thy father and thy mother. Because I'm telling you right now, if you can't love mom and daddy, you can't love nobody. Come on now. If you can't respect mom and daddy, you can't respect nobody. Yeah. That's where you learn all the, see, as a child, that's where everything is developed. So the first commandment, is the honor thy father and thy mother. Because if you can't get that relationship right, then you're going to have a difficult time in life Amen. establishing the rest of the relationships. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, that, that's, the first, that's the, uh, the first four commandments, and the next six deal with our relationship towards one another. Now, that says the first and greatest commandment The, now, the first and greatest commandment, now when Jesus came to earth, these lawyers and Pharisees began to try to challenge him on the law because they wanted, because the beautiful thing about the Lord is that there was no, they couldn't bring not one charge against him. He, he was totally innocent. He didn't violate not one thing in the law. And what they was trying to do was this whole time was trying to catch him in a technicality of the law. How they caught everybody else. You know, it was very technical of the law. You know what I'm saying? That's why they had all these fences and stuff. Well, they asked Jesus this interesting question. They said, Jesus, they said, uh, what is the greatest of all commandments? And he began to quote the Shema. And that is in uh, Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. And I think the uh, fourth verse. Anybody got their Bible? Now I like how this lays out. Sister, go ahead. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Is one Lord. Now stop right there. He let everybody know who he is. Yes. Now go ahead. And thou shalt love the Lord, shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. What that should tell you is to know the Lord as a love. That if you don't know the Lord, you can't love him. And he won't let you, he wants you to love him, so he won't let you know who he is. Amen. So you got to love God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Everything about you. Everything about you. You got you to you love the Lord with everything he said. And thy neighbor as thyself. Now, what I like about Jesus is that he always brought Clarity to the law. Uh, how many of y'all know that folk got a problem loving themselves? Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. Some folk don't know how to love themselves. And I'm telling you the truth. There was times in my life where I didn't love myself. I didn't know how to love myself right. So what do you do about somebody and they say, love the Lord and love the love your neighbor as thyself? Well, there was a time when I didn't love myself, and I don't, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I want you. To, I, don't, I think you wouldn't want me to treat you the way I was treating myself at that time. I was poisoning myself. Can I get amen? amen? So what Jesus did is that he brought clarity to that law when he, uh, if you would turn to uh, Saint John, the thirteenth chapter. 14th verse. Go 
Go ahead.
Because the hardest, y'all know the hardest person sometimes for you to forgive is yourself. And if you don't can't forgive yourself, you can't forgive nobody. Amen. So when you learn how to forgive yourself and learn to guess what? You know, I, people say, well, Melvin, why didn't you get mad at that, that, that dude for doing that to you? I said, because Bill Rose could have done a lot worse than other folks. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? And I ain't just talking about myself. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen. And everybody ain't always been saved right. since you've been saved. Mm. <laughs> we all still need God's mercy. Amen. All still need God's grace. Amen. And when you, when, you, when you learn it, you have to learn how to love in spite of the way you want somebody to love you. You love other folk in spite of it. Right. You ain't so hard on other folk. Can I get an amen? amen? And therein is when the law is going to be fulfilled. Amen. Not when you can sit up there and say, you know, uh, like the Pharisees did, you know. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The law didn't remove sin. Sin is still sin. Yes, it is. I want to make that clear. The law was not sin. The law just pointed out sin. And like, Pat, like the bishop say, there is these things called universal laws and universal sins. I didn't understand what that meant. So one day I was sitting around, I was thinking about it. I said, what do you mean? Universal. And some thought about it and said, wait a minute. The alien came down from outer space in a flying saucer and landed in that field. One thing I know is one thing nobody knew where Captain might be out there to look. We're probably all with other direction. <laughs> <laughs> but the people that do gather around that flying saucer to look at it, that hatch come down, and that alien walk out that door, he going to say, this is my flying saucer. And this is my ray gun. If you try to steal my flying saucer, I'm going to shoot you with this ray gun. So what they tell you is no matter where you go in the universe, stealing is wrong. <laughs> and you don't need no Bible to tell you that stealing is wrong. Can I get an amen? And what the law did was just they, they said, stealing is wrong, even though they knew it. You know what I'm saying? That goes into the also the... Uh, I, when I was studying this lesson, I kind of got into what they call, and I'm out to close, cultural love, uh, where you was where you was looking at universal laws, and what I found out is that they have this group of indigenous people in South America, and all they have is beads going around their waist. Are you amen? Amen. But you want to know something interesting? The women's beads is looking different than the men's. Well. So what they tell you is that if you look at all these different cultures, no matter what culture you have, there's a distinct dress between men and women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No matter what, if they heard the Bible or not, there is a distinct dress between men and women. There is no cross dress. And let they have Western influence, which Western influence starts to try to tell people, oh, it's all right to cross dress. No. If cross dressing was wrong, cross dressing would be wrong in America. Cross dressing is wrong in Scotland. Cross dressing is wrong in China. Cross dressing is wrong wherever you go. That is what you call a universal law or sin. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. And guess what? It still ain't changed. If it was wrong yesterday, it's wrong. If it was wrong yesterday, if it was sin yesterday, guess what it is today? Sin. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. So therefore, the Bible Paul said that, that how do we are dead, are dead to sin live any more longer therein? When you become born again, you are born. The person that, that, that old person dies. That's why we bury him in that tank. And then a new person rises to walk to the newness of life. So that old man is dead. So how did you are dead to sin live any longer therein? So in other words,
words, when you become saved, you change what you do. You change your walk, your talk, your dress, you know. Now, I, this is a battle. Can I get an amen? This is a battle. And no matter what I call it, what's it going to be? Now, what they have nowadays with postmodernism is they believe that if they can change the name of something, they can change its identity and functionality. It's not so. In other words, I, if they say postmodernists believe that if you call something uh, a battery or a baseball long enough, people will actually start acting like it's a baseball and going like a baseball. But the truth of the matter is, is that what you call something doesn't determine it's what it is. You know what determines what it is? Say it, sister, or it's function. Because this charge is something, its function determines what it is. Its behavior determines what it is. Not what you call it. What am I saying? Just because you call yourself a Christian, don't make you one. It is your behavior which determines what you are and what your function is. Amen, amen. Come on. Now, say that there is true. That there is a law of grace. God did not come to say, oh, you can live in sin, now that grace is no. Behavior still determines functionality, and functionality determines what something is. Can I get an amen? So if you can't love, like the Lord says you love, tell you love, then you're not a Christian. Can I get an amen? If you're not functioning as one, then that is not what you are. Amen. They tell people that they can live any old kind. Let me tell you something. I'm about to take my seat. But before I take my seat, I'm going to make it plain. They, they are trying to change the name of things to change the definition of it. It ain't no longer shacking. It's called a whole house table. Or what they call it, uh, uh, common law marriage. In this church, it's still shack. And they say, oh, it ain't a lie no more. It's called a misspoke. A lie is still a lie. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? And let me tell you something. When I stop becoming it, when I, when I, when I can't, man, that's what, I love Mr. Allen. Because we came from the same, you know, when, when I came out of the gay life, I stopped dressing like I was in the game life. Can I get an amen? amen? I started acting like I was in the game life. Amen. I even left that game talk behind. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm, I hope I said something right, y'all. It's the rest of the man of in the hands of the bishop for remarks and correction. Amen. amen. Right, preacher. Right, bishop. 
How do you honor your heavenly father? By obeying what he has laid out for you. Praise God. So that's real good about you know, when we think in terms of uh, our relationship with our mother and father. How could you have a good relationship with God if you don't have a, uh, a good relationship with your neighbor? Amen. See, the neighbor is what you can see. Right. The neighbor is what you can touch. Right. Amen. Praise God. You can't skip your neighbor and have a relationship with God. Amen. 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 That's why it's so important people don't realize how we treat other people. God is going to hold us account. Right. Amen. 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 Um, I'll be very honest with you that uh, we got in Tulsa, we have all these uh, people that are homeless going around. And um, I appreciate uh, Oklahoma, we have to. Facilities, you know, like John 316. Uh, we have a place where they can stay downtown, uh, you know, and uh, we have a place where they can go eat, you know. And so it's amazing how people can take the attitude and, well, they don't deserve that. They do deserve it. That's part of being good to your neighbor. Amen. They may not be in the right place. They may not be saved. But they're hungry. They need clothes. They need a shelter. That's why it's so important. Uh, people don't understand that it's one thing. Politics is one thing. Right. But obeying the word of God is That's enough. a whole other thing. Come on. That's where people get so hung up. Amen. And the politics of things. And what happened was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they got hung up in the politics. In the politics of it. And they became so called self righteous. Simply because they executed the law. But they could be self-righteous, execute the law without love. That's the key. The Bible said, he that hung and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. In other words, in so many words, it's simply doing, having hunger to do the right thing. Do what's that's what the Lord wants us to do. That's right. Do what's right. right. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rose.